And so without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Rosemary Haggett, Vice Chancellor for Academic Affairs at the University of North Texas System to introduce our second keynote speaker. Dr. Haggett. Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Norma Ming, who is a learning scientist and educational technology thought leader who works at the intersection of research and development policy and practice. She's a co-founder and director of learning design at SOCOS, which applies cognitive modeling to uh, create adaptive, personalized educational technology. Fits right into everything we've been talking about today. Previously, Dr. Ming worked as a senior research scientist at the Nexus Research and Policy Center and taught as a lecturer in education in math, science, and technology at UC Berkeley's Graduate School of Education, where she is now a visiting scholar. She earned an AB with honors in chemistry at Harvard University and a PhD in cognitive psychology from Carnegie Mellon University. Dr. Mean tells me that one of the best educators for her regarding teaching and learning have been her two young children who have influenced her view of uh, education and its long-term importance. Dr. Ming merges a pragmatic understanding of the teaching enterprise with a long-term systemic vision of how research can illuminate and policy can facilitate better teaching and learning. Given today's focus on teaching and learning in the 21st century, I think she's the perfect person to be our second keynote speaker. Today she'll be talking to us about balancing standardization with personalization. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Ming to the podium. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. I'm delighted and honored to be here to be able to participate in this conversation about some very important changes that are going on in higher education. As Rosemary said, I'll be talking about standardization and personalization two movements that I see going on in higher education and in K-12 at the same time. And I kind of wonder, are they going in parallel to each other? Are they going against each other? I'm not sure if they're working together, if they're about to collide. But I think there are two halves of the, many of the same issues. And I think it's really important for us to look at how they interact with each other. So don't waste a good crisis. Right now, we've got a crisis about the cost in higher education, and people are wondering, is college worth it? As the lead of this article focuses on, we question whether co college costs too much. But the flip side of that, of that same, kind, the same coin about cost, is value. And that's what I want to focus on. What is the value that higher education is providing? So there are three fundamental questions that I think underpin this that I'd really like to focus on very specifically. The most important one, of course, is what should students learn? What is the goal of higher education? What is the service that we intend to provide to them? Once we've identified that goal, what is it that we think students should learn? The next two questions are, how do we know that they've got there? How are we going to assess that learning? And then, of course, the whole business of education, how should we facilitate that learning? So the fundamental question about standardization is what should stay constant? What is it that is so important that it needs to stay the same across all of these institutions, across the whole enterprise? With regard to what students should learn, the knowledge, that seems fairly straightforward. What is it that we know that the students know, those entrance standards, what are those prerequisites that they have to know in order to learn? What are the exit standards? What is that we expect them to be able to do when they're done? So those are the, the next two bullet points there, articulation of the prerequisites. We need to be very clear, in order to learn this material, this is what they need to know first. And then, definitions of mastery. What do we believe it means for them to know what it is that they are supposed to have learned? That seems fairly straightforward, but as many people have been discussing just here today, we haven't exactly been doing that very well so far. What we need to be doing is defining what the students know and what they've learned according to the knowledge, not the amount of time they've spent doing it. And so far the tradition has generally been, how long have you spent doing it? We need to move to knowledge because that is what ultimately matters. 
So we've got a lot of competency-based learning, education um, uh, initiatives. We've got badges, um, certificates. And what this does is it blurs the lines between formal and informal learning. People are learning all the time, not just within these institutions, but they need to have a way of certifying that knowledge so that other people can validate it and can trust. They really do know these things. Simply saying, oh, I, I know this material isn't sufficient. It becomes sufficient when they're on the job and they have a chance to show that knowledge, but they may not get that opportunity at all. They need to have that, both for the sake of the work that they intend to do and for the other people who are entering those institutions thinking, well, I already know this material, this is what I need to know in order to get to the next step in whatever my life goal is. They need a way of knowing what that looks like. So once we've identified what the knowledge is, that we care about and have some standards for measuring that. We need to figure out exactly which data are relevant for that. As I was suggesting earlier, this is relevant for the students um, as well as for the institutions so, and future employers who want to look at whether the students really have learned what they claim to have learned. And then on the other side, students who are comparing institutions. Which institution is going to serve my needs? They need a way of looking across institutions and seeing they really have done a good job of serving students like me or serving students who have my kinds of goals. So that's on the outside. That's a little bit more of the accountability side. On the inside, this is absolutely critical. All of these institutions, anybody who participates in the enterprise of education needs to know how can we improve. We're not going to know that without good data. So we need better data in order to conduct better analytics so that we can assess the knowledge that the students have, we can evaluate how well our programs are meeting those goals, and then improve all of our processes. Something that I like to say is we should use data for good and not evil. Well, we're doing a whole lot of evil with the accountability and scaring people as to what they aren't doing enough of, but we have to do more of the good. We have to focus on now that we know what is going well and what isn't going well, what are the processes that we can improve upon based on those data? I think we need to put a lot more of our emphasis there. So which data should we be collecting and how? Everything, we should collect everything. So I think traditionally people have done a lot of collecting of data on inputs and outputs in terms of the students. They say the demographic background, where they came from. Um, they have a sense of uh, all, all of the standard information about what their students look like. It's kind of like a, like a lead customer. And then the outputs, how many students graduated, how long did it take them, just so you have a, a general sense of how well the institution is doing. But we need a lot more process data for the sake of formative assessment within the classroom, but for the institution as well. What are the instructional processes? So what is it that the instructor is doing? Because that is where we need to have the improvement. Are they giving feedback at the right times, of the right nature? Do the students actually know? What are we doing when the students are confused? How do we respond to that? That is where we have the opportunity to make the improvement. And then, because the whole purpose of having data is to get information, we need to share that information and share the data with other people. So we need to agree on what it means to be successful. So is a student successful who has taken 50% uh, longer to graduate than the standard time? That's a, we need an arbitrary measure, but what about all of the other people? How are we going to compare students who have transferred from one institution to another? We need some common way of measuring that so that we can figure out how best to serve them. So one example of this is the common, educa uh, common education data standards. I have not looked at it very closely to be able to provide either a critique or an endorsement, but I simply mention it as an example of one movement in trying to come up with some common sta standards that we can use across institutions. It's very detailed. I invite you all to take a look at it and decide, do you think it would work well for your institutions? So now that we've identified what should stay constant in terms of the knowledge and how we measure the data, Let's get to what we care about, the practices. So why would practices need to stay constant? Well, there are people here who are much more qualified to answer that than I am in terms of the operational side of it. You need consistency within your institution. You need efficiency and economy. For people to be doing things the same way allows you to uh, reap those benefits. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the instructional practices because that's what I'll be focusing on. These are the practices that I think we need a lot more attention to. We need to be aware of what it is that constitutes good teaching in order to improve that. So I won't go into all of these. They're very comprehensively described 
in these books that are derived from research in the learning sciences, uh, observations, interviews with great teachers. Since we know so much collectively as a field about what good instruction looks like, what helps students learn, we should take advantage of that knowledge. Those are the things that we should be implementing across the board. Those are the things that should stay the same. So in light of all of these things that we know are really important, the things that we have to keep the same across institutions, across the enterprises, why personalize at all? So right now, just in the last month or so, there's been an interesting debate going on in the blogosphere about the value of personalization. Some people are saying that we absolutely need to do it. We need to take advantage of the abilities of the technology to better serve students, to give them what it is that they need based on where they're going and what their strengths are. And then we have some other people who are claiming, well, this actually isn't that valuable. Look at the learning sciences. We already know that this is what we need to be doing. We should focus on that more. So why personalize at all? I would say one of the biggest arguments for this is one of equity. We don't all start in the same place. Students go across so many different life experiences. Most of the discussion and debate that I was just describing about personalization is happening around K-12 implicitly. They don't necessarily state that, but much of the assumption uh, that goes into it is about K-12. I would say that uh, I can often understand some of that discussion about how we already know what it is that the students need to learn. How different does it need to be? But that multiplies as you get on to higher ed. Because at that point, students have had so many more years of different life experiences, all of those gaps just magnify. At this point, you've got adult learners who have had vastly different opportunities and vastly different experiences. At this point, you really do need to think about where it is that they came from because they are so different from each other. How do you serve them and give them the opportunities that they really need so that they can take advantage of them? So that's on the entrance side. Another argument is economy. On the exit side, students are different not just when they come in, but they're different in where they want to go. They have different goals. And this is fundamental to our economy in terms of the labor market and what it is that they're going to be doing. Our economy does not need millions of people doing the exact same thing. So it doesn't make sense to train them for the exact same thing and to provide the uh, same education to all of them. We need specialization. We need people with a diversity of skills. And that is one of the goals of higher education, is to provide that training for all of these different purposes. But there's another sense in which I mean economy. And it may seem ironic here, because previously, just in the last slide, I said economy is worthwhile for standardization of practices. Here, however, if you think about what happens if you don't tailor your education to the student's needs, you're wasting a lot of resources. It doesn't make sense to teach somebody something they already know. What a waste of their time and yours and resources. They could have done something else with that. It's a huge opportunity cost. You could have done something else institutionally with those resources for a student who actually needed that. Same on the end of it. It's also a waste to provide an education to someone who doesn't need that. They don't need to learn that material because that doesn't serve them. It doesn't move them toward their goals. So what we need to do is provide some level of personalization to meet what their needs are as well as their goals. And finally, this one's a little ironic as well. The first two are clearly dimensions by which people differ. The third one matters to everybody. You have to personalize in order to make learning meaningful for everyone. They need to find ways of connecting to it to make it relevant to them for it to stick. Otherwise, you've got inert knowledge. You've got this course with material, a syllabus, and it just disappears at the other end because they don't have the opportunity to think, when am I going to use this? How does this connect to my life? Every single person needs to be doing that kind of interaction with material. How is it meaningful to me? And how do I use this with other people? How do other people help me reflect on it more deeply? How do they challenge me to try to use it? Those are the important dimensions of personalization for everyone that make the learning more meaningful. So what should vary? I'll address these along the same three dimensions knowledge, data, and practices, but I'll frame them a little bit differently. Knowledge is the same. We've already discussed this. People are different in the knowledge they need to learn. Their goals vary. They're different in terms of their entering and their exit points. So students come in with different prior knowledge. This is one of those robust findings from learning science, is that what your prior knowledge is determines what you're going to be able to learn. 
because people come in at different points, use that. You have to work with them so that their prior knowledge helps them and be aware of the ways in which it might hinder them. So provide instruction that is aligned to those needs and those strengths. The exit points, as I mentioned, vary. They're going to do different things with it. So provide education to them to those goals. And then the paths can vary. There are multiple routes to success. You don't need people to go on the exact same hike in order to do something that works for them. You can, and you can get something out of it, but let them start from where they needed to start from and get where they need to get, and take the path that works for them. They won't all be the same, and that is perfectly okay. By creating more modular experiences, now they can experience that learning environment that is most valuable for them. So for data, I'm going to focus on assessment. What we care about is what it is that we're assessing, what's the knowledge that we're looking for, when we're assessing it, and how. The assessment of what, I think, is fairly straightforward from the previous point. They need to know different things, so the assessment should be different. You're not going to give everybody the same test if the knowledge you're expecting of them differs. When also that varies. It doesn't make sense to give everyone the same test at the same time when they're not necessarily learning at the same rates. Test them at those times that are most worthwhile for them, and their life constraints are different. Sometimes somebody is going to need to be taking longer because that's a part-time student who has to work with life and work constraints. The how is different as well. Typically, we have a, a test that we deliver in a certain manner. That's sort of the pinnacle of standardized testing. We need to keep everything controlled, keep it all constant so that we know that in this environment where we controlled it exactly in this way, this is what they're able to do. Extremely wonderful for internal validity, but that's not the only way somebody can demonstrate knowledge. There are so many more ways in which a person can and should demonstrate that knowledge. You, what you want to know is that not only can they do it in that environment, but they can also demonstrate that knowledge in some other environment, as typically happens in the workplace. You have to do it in a very different kind of a, a situation there. So test them, assess them in multiple different contexts, especially because you might get somebody who knows something and one is able to demonstrate that knowledge in one context and not another. You can argue it both directions. You can say, if you only knew it on the test but you didn't know it in the other ways, that knowledge didn't transfer, what good is it? But you can also think of it in terms of an equity perspective that somebody is not very successful at demonstrating knowledge in this one way. Look at it across a different way. Or you can look at how robust the knowledge is. Somebody who really can use this knowledge can show that in a, multiple, in a multitude of uh, contexts. So look at those. And this happens to be consistent with what you want to do in instruction. We're not having them learn all in the same way all the time. We're giving them multiple different ways of experiencing the material. So now the assessment has the opportunity to be closer to the instruction. It doesn't have to be something that's completely sequestered. So when I say naturalistic, I mean it should be what they are doing to learn, just whatever happens in the natural environment. Unstructured because it no longer has to be a certain question with a set of predetermined answers that we are choosing from because now we know that means that they know this and they don't know that and they don't know this mistake. Just give them whatever experience you think is best for teaching. Let the technology, let the algorithms do a lot of the assessing, uh, assessing of them after that. So we've seen a lot of different really exciting examples of how we can use analytics in a variety of ways to inform education. So we can do predictive analytics in the form of seeing what is it that can tell us when a student might be about to drop out or disengage or to have trouble in some way, and then how can we intervene at the right time in the right way to support them. So that's starting at the topmost level, just before they're about to drop out. The most important key signal we really need to know. We can go deeper than that as well to look a little bit more at the learning that's happening. So we can see examples of the faculty dashboard shown in the Open Learning Initiative, where now, not just at the level of the administrators or the institution, but also for the instructors, now they can see what is it that my student knows along all of these things that are important in the course, and get a measure of that, and then start to dig in a little deeper to the individual students. You can also do it with some of the intelligent tutoring at the level of the individual student, so that they now have the information that, to act on themselves, so they can see what is it that I know where am I struggling? Oh, what is it that I'm spending more time on or less time on? How can I use that to inform my own learning process? We can go deeper than that. 
I'm just curious, what, what, do you, what do you think this is? What does this look like to you? What's that? Uh, gathered points? Data, data points, yes. Yes, okay. Um, I've had people tell me that it looks like a flying bird. It tells you something, but we don't really, uh, we, we can't see it all that clearly. I'm not sure if you can actually see the colors. That central axis there is uh, moving towards blue, and the outside we see red and orange, so it kind of goes along the colors of the rainbow. So you might be able to see some convergence there. So we've got data points, but what are they data points of? Does this help you? We're assessing knowledge and discussions. That may not be much of a clue there. Each of those data points represents a single discussion thread from an online discussion forum in the same course. This happens to be uh, an economics course for MBA students. Uh, this is within a six-week course. They all have the same discussion questions that uh, Yes, the, either the discussion questions might not have been identical, but the, the syllabus, the course design, was, was generally the same. So what we see here is those points are converging. So red is the first week. Uh, then as you go on to the uh, blue, that gets to be the last week of the course. So you see a pattern there, a trend, where the discussion content is converging over time so they're kind of in a cloud all over the place at the beginning, and as it, the course progresses, they start to converge in some central area. So this is showing you that the students are actually approaching some kind of agreement, some kind of a consensus about what they should be talking about, because this is what's going on in the discussion. And this also happens across classes, because now you see, instead of it being just completely a dispersed cloud, they actually are uh, agreeing with each other across all of these um, hundreds of classes. This is 1,000 students and 70,000 posts in the discussion. This is way off the other end in terms of assessment. This isn't just, are they meeting these goals? Are they dropping out? Are they getting these grades? This is looking really deep into the content of what it is they're talking about. But we could use this kind of unstructured assessment and map it to the accountability that we care about, the grades, that we know have already been validated up to a certain extent. I realize they're imperfect, but since we use them, let's just see how close they are. We can take this kind of topic modeling, uh, all in, I, I won't go into all the details of it, we can take a bunch of words in a discussion, or a bunch of words in essays, and analyze them to see, are there patterns in those words, in terms of how the words co-occur, that we can use to tell us something about the grades. So what we did here was we simply looked at the average number of words, that's the, uh, that's the blue in the count, and we compared that against two different ways of modeling the topics that the students were talking about in the discussions. And as the course progressed, those predictions got better. So if you just guess the average of the course, you're not gonna get a whole lot of power out of that, that's the baseline at the top, and that's the error from the actual course grade, the error decreases, so the predictions are getting better. And yes, it's not that surprising that the more words the students are producing, the more your prediction improves, because you've got more information to work from, and it might also be that the students who start to say less are the ones who are less engaged in the course, and so it's not that surprising that they might be um, doing worse as the course goes along, or it might also be they don't have as much to say because they don't understand it. So that's not surprising, that's kind of a little bit of a control so we can see that makes sense. But the topic modeling does better than that. That there are algorithms that we can apply to look at the content of what students are saying without putting in what the right answer is, and we see it naturally converging. That by the end of the course, by the end of the six weeks, we are within one letter grade. It is possible to use these pretty cutting edge techniques to look at the content, not just the grades, not where we put in questions and answers and we know exactly what the answer is gonna be. We didn't put in the right answer here. Yet the system itself, based on the data that the students produced, not the instructors, we have some kind of a correspondence to the final grade. 
So I give that to you just as a flavor of what's possible. I think it's very exciting if we take all of the different forms of assessment and try to put them together so we get a much richer picture of what's going on and try to connect the very intimate knowledge of what the students are doing in class with the high level. How well did they learn what we wanted them to learn? So that's just one demonstration of how we have a lot of possible ways of varying the assessment that we use. Now, for instruction. What we really, really care about, how do we actually serve our students? What are the ways in which instruction should vary and be personalized? As I mentioned, students have different needs, they have different strengths, and they have different preferences. We want to work with those in order to provide the instruction that best serves them. They have very different constraints and resources. As I mentioned earlier, they have different life constraints, and that's especially true in higher ed with adult learners compared to younger learners. It's not realistic to expect them to meet certain constraints if that's just not consistent with their schedule, and those are very different. So we need to be cognizant of that and design around that. Universally, they all have different resources. They come from different home environments. They have different communities. They have different workplaces that they might be interfacing with. The institutions are different. The teachers are different. Build on those strengths. Personalization shouldn't just happen at the level of the student. It should happen at the level of the instructor and the institution as well. Depending on the resources you have, you should feel free to take advantage of those opportunities. Encourage that wonderful instructor who has access to this unusual activity because of somebody in the community. You should have the opportunity to do that. And personalization is one avenue through which that can come to fruition. And that's the support networks. Those are all different, and so we should allow our instruction to take advantage of that. So I'm going to draw a distinction here between adaptive learning and personalized learning. So adaptive learning is what a lot of people have been talking about in terms of using the machine intelligence with intelligent tutors, cognitive tutors, to adapt to what the students already know and what their needs are. A lot of the criticisms around this, I think, have been against a very narrow type of adaptive learning, which is very powerful, but has not yet gotten to the point of really being extremely expansive. And so that's what I mean by adapt, but don't pander. I'm not sure how well this has been circulated, but my sense is that learning styles have been very popular. They've kind of popped up as a cottage industry where people will say, oh, well, I'm this kind of a learner, and so I, I need to have the instruction provided this way. The research actually doesn't support that. The research does not show that it's better for the learners if you find out that they have some kind of a learning style and you provide instruction in that form. It might be true, but the research hasn't yet shown that. So it may not be what we want to be putting a lot of resources toward. There might be more effective ways of achieving that goal. So that's one way in which I'm saying, don't, don't pander to them. That may not be what they really need. Student as consumer doesn't mean that they choose absolutely everything. Yes, they should get some choice, but you don't necessarily need to throw the gates wide open and say, you choose what you want to learn. They may not have the capacity to do that because they don't have enough knowledge and experience. So don't put, that into the, don't put them into that environment where they are going to have to choose for themselves when they may not be prepared to make the best choice. Choice can also be overwhelming, even for an informed consumer. Just-in-time learning has its value, but it needs to be broader. It's not simply that you give them exactly that one thing that they need most at this point and you never challenge them beyond that. There is going to be variability. We don't predict absolutely everything. There are some things we don't yet know. And the way to discover it is to try it out. Same thing with the learner. There's something at them once in a while just to see what happens. That's the way life is anyway. We shouldn't design our instructional experiences to be so constrained that they have nothing to do with the real world. We need to find out how they respond to that and help them respond to that challenge. So what should we adapt on? I just named all the things we shouldn't do. Well, prior knowledge. What kinds of mistakes do they make? What are their misconceptions? How can we work with those most productively? Present is all of the instructional processes. What kind of scaffolding is the most worthwhile to give to them? Some students need more, some students need less. Those are some dimensions that would be worthwhile for us to pay attention to. How do they respond to feedback? There might be some students who respond extremely poorly to comparative feedback. They don't want to be competing against other students, so it may be detrimental to them. If you have data on that, then now you know that wouldn't be appropriate. But there might be other students for whom that is extremely motivating. How well can they self-regulate? 
Some students are able to keep that focus. They know what their goal is. They know that all of these things are leading to that goal. Other students may be floundering and feeling kind of lost at sea. Why, why am I doing this? How is this going to help me? They might need a little bit more of a nudge from somebody else in the community who can say, oh yeah, I, I was there, that was hard for me, but it paid off. And as I mentioned earlier, real life constraints, those vary, adapt to those. And of course, why are they there? What's their motivation for learning for that? Work with that so that they can see what that connection is. How you build that for them may differ. So all of that's adaptive learning. How do we personalize it? And what I mean by personalized is going beyond the machine intelligence to human intelligence. People have a lot of intelligence, and that is not going to change. We are not going to be able to use machine intelligence to do everything. We're always going to have something that's a little surprising, because people are the ones who are programming the machines. You're always going to have something that somebody says that, well, we haven't seen this before. We, we can't predict this. And people are the ones who are best equipped to deal with it. That can be the student who does something surprising. That can be the instructor who has this new insight and wants to try something different. We need to make room for that human intelligence because it is so powerful. So the first one is that student who can do something that surprises you. You need something personal for the student. And then the next one is the, the people interacting with each other. You've got those intelligences, all of those brains interacting. Take advantage of that. And the third one is the instructor in particular. So one of the challenges with personalized learning is if it becomes too individualized. If you get a situation where you've figured out all of these parameters and you've come up with this experience for this one student alone, that's not gonna be very productive. Students, none of us really, most of us I'll say, don't learn that well when we're completely alone. We need a little bit of interaction with other people to make the experience come to life, to challenge us when we didn't think of something, to support us when we're feeling a little bit confused and a little bit lost. Learning is so fundamentally social, so we need to keep that personalized element in there. So I think it's another mistake that's often been made to assume that the kind of learning experience you provide for somebody in an adaptive environment is one where you find all of the people who match on this one dimension and you put them together and you give them this one experience. People need to have different perspectives in there. People who know different information, they learn more from them. It's a surprise and now they need to deal with that surprise. They get some new insight, they question something that they thought they already knew. It is because of those differences that people are able to learn so well. On the other hand, you do have to create common ground. You have to make sure that people have some kind of shared understanding and shared experience to have an interaction around. You can't take people at all of these different parts of the terrain and throw them together and expect them to very quickly come up with an intelligible conversation. You have to provide something for them to talk about. That can be through different activities that they're doing uh, at the same time. Um, it can be doing the same activities at different times so now they can talk about what they've done in uh, different time points or it could be different roles in the same activity uh, at the same time. It doesn't have to be all identical in order for them to have that conversation. It doesn't all have to be like a book club where everyone has to be reading the exact same book at the same time. And in fact, it's a lot more like what happens in the real world. You have people working on the same project, but they have different parts of it. You can do the same thing with the instruction, and it's still personalized. They're still doing what's best for them to help them toward their goals. So build upon those cohorts, develop them deliberately. You can't just throw them together. So one of the challenges with online learning is that you have a, this invisibility. You don't know who else is in your group. You don't know what they're doing. You don't have that opportunity. Seed that in some way. You have to think about, so what kind of a cohort is going to be productive? What do they need to know about each other? What do they have to have in common? It doesn't necessarily have to be that they're all going to be in the same program and they're all working for the same company. That might not be the glue that sticks them together. So we need to look at that a little bit further and be more strategic. And to build on their outside communities, their support networks. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, this is the reason I call it personalized instruction and not just personalized learning. You need to think about the instructor. That instructor has unique strengths and expertise in knowing what to do next, both in terms of the previous students that that person has worked with, but also in terms of the other uh, resources to draw from.
because of all of the differences that personalization draws from and demands, now it becomes all the more crucial that we provide good support for self-directed learning. Think of all of the open educational resources that are out there. Think of everything that's out there on the web. Think of all of the different experiences they have. It is much more difficult to navigate that for learners, especially those who have gone through a traditional system. If you're used to, as a student, being fed everything and being told, no, no, you have to do it this way. This is what comes next. It becomes much more difficult to remember all of that natural motivation and curiosity you had when you were much younger and to think, what do I do with this? Now that I've seen all of this world of possibility, oh my goodness, where, where do I go next? It's easy to get lost. This makes it all the more important for us to cultivate that autonomy, that sense of purpose, that ability to master something from an early age throughout the entire educational career. So we now actually can and should personalize the instruction of self-directed learning. I think the clearest example of that is in how you would foster a growth mindset. So uh, I'm not sure if everyone here is familiar with the mindset that you could have um, a performance orientation or um, a fixed mindset where you believe that intelligence is just something that you're born with. You got it, you know. So then your feeling is when you do well, it's because you're smart, you're talented. And when you don't do well, oh, well, it's because you're just not so good at it. You're not so smart, you're not so capable, you're not so talented. But a growth mindset is one where you believe that I'm smart because I put in all of this effort. I tried and I did all of these things to help myself learn. That response to failure is very different. That one is, I messed up or I didn't do well perhaps because these are some things that I could have done and I didn't do well. How do you scaffold that? Sure, you can give people stories about some successful famous people and how they failed. That's been shown to be successful. Or that's been shown to be helpful in fostering a growth mindset. But there's only so far that goes. People need to transfer that belief that, yes, you can learn through a lot of hard work and a lot of errors and it's productive to what happens to their own experiences. Imagine giving this feedback. So your hard work paid off or, no, just just keep swimming, just keep trying, or all right, that didn't work so well, what could you do differently? All of that is helpful feedback in fostering a growth mindset, but only if it matches. You can't just give this generically. Imagine if you switched some of the feedback with those scenarios. It wouldn't make any sense at all. Your hard work paid off, oh, no, it didn't. <laughs> I'm really struggling, or just keep doing that. Not if it's an unproductive thing that the person is doing. That feedback needs to match. That is fundamentally personalization. You have to be attentive to this. And ultimately, these are what employers are looking for. They're not quite as interested in those individual skills, possibly because they don't trust the schools for having met them. Just because somebody has a degree doesn't mean that in a certain program, doesn't mean that they know what you need them to know as an employer. What employers are looking for is a lot of these skills that you might call meta-learning or 21st century skills, um, what else, soft skills, critical thinking, higher order thinking skills, creativity, self-regulation, collaboration. This is what they're looking for. And this is what ultimately matters. They're looking for somebody that can learn because the nature of our labor market, the nature of information exchange has changed. Information is going back and forth so quickly that the kind of job that's going to be available is different. What they need them to know is different. I mean, even with a computer science degree, oh, well, what you learned four years ago, it's not true anymore. So I don't need somebody who simply knows that material. I need somebody who's capable and will put, have the initiative to put in that time and that effort to struggle through something new and different and solve this problem for me. So these are the kinds of skills that matter. Self-regulated learning. We need somebody who's going to keep going and be motivated, not just because they've got a corner office and they've got this nice salary, but because they're willing to do something hard. They succeeded at closing the sale, but now they're working on the next one because it's interesting to them, they're curious, they want to do it. Collaboration is another, uh, another big one. We want people who are able to work with each other. And then creativity, I'm lumping in the problem solving and the curiosity in there as well. All of these things are critically important 
which is not to say that the actual content knowledge is irrelevant. We still need to know that. Take metacognition. You can't get accurate metacognition if they don't know the, the knowledge in the first place. So the risk of getting a little too meta. You need to know that the student knows what it means to know something. So they need to know something in the first place. They can't know what it means to know something if they didn't know it. So they can't have the metacognition if they didn't have the cognition. So you still need to get the cognition of the actual content matter, but you now also have to do the metacognition on top of it. Because the companies aren't gonna trust that they're able to learn if they never saw evidence that they learned something in the first place. So this brings me back full circle. And this isn't typically what most people mean when they say closing the loop. Do we need standards for meta learning? And how should we assess that meta learning? I've made the argument that we need to personalize it, and I would say that yes, there are ways of assessing it, but how do we do that, and should we standardize that? I'll let you all discuss that. We have some time for questions. You're really making me work out, Jim, especially after lunch. <clears throat> hey, thank you very much for that talk. And I just wanted to, to ask you, one of the questions that's, you know, the learning analytics move right now in personalized is interesting, and I like that you brought up the debate happening right now with people like Dan Meyer, and I think Audrey Waters talked about it recently, but a whole host of people. And one of the questions I brought up that I thought was interesting, and I wonder what you would, your reaction to this would be, is you know, one of the questions about personalization that we gotta think about is um, who's writing those algorithms? How do they kind of frame, who do they normalize the person to be? And how do some of the kind of elements you're talking about that are gonna make this possible and scale also start to um, you know, build a system itself that reinforces the idea? Do you know what I mean? Like, so as a researcher, how do you straddle those two points and how do we understand how these algorithms work and their limitations? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, 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 I think I understand the point you're making. So the first level of that is why I embrace and endorse unstructured assessment. So my feeling is that a lot of the um, adaptive learning that's out there is an expert system that has been very carefully designed by a certain team of experts with extraordinary expertise, many of my highly esteemed colleagues doing fantastic work there, yet it's still limited to that particular set of data and that particular perspective on how we interpret those data. So in going to unstructured assessment, as I mentioned with the other data that I was showing, we didn't put in the expert knowledge. That's all bottom up from what the students happen to produce. So that's one possible, um, I won't call it an answer, but one possible angle that will help expand the knowledge base. The second part of that is making sure that the students we're drawing data from are sufficiently broad. So it's not just one narrow sample of this particular type of student. We need to look much bigger than that. And that is a criticism that I would raise in general of much of the learning sciences, is that oftentimes, the data are drawn from a very narrow sample of students. It's one of the things that's really fascinating to me about the growth in online learning and non-traditional students. We're now getting data from students that we often didn't get data on previously. We need to continue to do that, but there's another step that we still need to do. In terms of the digital divide, there are lots of students who don't have that kind of access. We need to make sure that we are at least aware of the fact that we don't yet have their data and figure out ways to get there. I appreciate your presentation and emphasis on uh, the knowledge component of competence. Um, I have a question regarding how, what level of granularity uh, you seek in terms of defining knowledge components. Um, for example, 
you might use these tools in a course, and yet the course may be directed towards the development of some number of competencies. Do you have any work uh, directed at providing competency-specific measures in terms of a psychometric perspective? Uh, are you working towards producing or figuring out how to produce a reliable and valid measure of each of the competencies that your courses are directed at? Yeah, I'm trying not to say it depends. It's something that I think has to be done empirically because there are limits to what you get out of going increasingly more granular. I'm thinking of it in terms of main effects and interactions. There comes a point when getting down to all of those levels, the, all of those intricate details, doesn't have much payoff. And so that would be the empirical component of it, figuring out how fine do we need to go. So obviously we need to go deeper than just the grade at the end of the course. We need to go deeper than just the final exam. I can't give a number as to how much, down, how much further down we need to keep drilling, but I think that's something that we would have to investigate empirically. It may actually vary depending on the domain in the course. I wish I could give you a more detailed answer than that, but I, I think it really does have to be done empirically. If anyone thinks of any other questions, please, I'd be interested in discussing them. Thank you. Thank you.